So welcome everyone to this week Autonomy Talks. This week is a great pleasure to have with us uh, Robert Kutchman, who is an assistant professor of robotics at ETH and, and he heads the Soft Robotics Lab. So let me tell you something about Robert. He got his diploma engineer from KIT, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and then moved from, to, uh, to US where he obtained his PhD in mechanical engineering uh, from CSAIL at MIT. And then uh, uh, prior to joining ETH, he worked uh, on robotic manipulation uh, uh, as applied scientist first at Amazon and then at CTO as Dexai Robotics. So in his, in his research, he takes inspiration from living creatures and develops uh, robots which can deform and uh, adapt to their environment when compared to traditional robots. In his lab, and you will see a lot of nice videos today uh, or, or on his webpage, uh, he creates designs and fabricates models and controls soft robot systems. And uh, you will see various types of them, for instance, robot fishes uh, for ocean exploration or arms for dynamic manipulation tasks. Today he's going to talk about uh, uh, rethinking how we make robots if we want to explore the world. And I'm personally very excited about, about the abstract of the talk. And therefore, I give the stage to yours, Robert. Hey, thank you very much, Jole. This was very nice um, to uh, be invited and have the chance to present our group's work. And so let me just dive right into it. Um, so the talk today is about how we're trying to, in our group's research, rethink how we make robots. And that includes not only how we design and fabricate, but also how to control them. And we, the goal of our work is to make robots that actually are reasonably capable in exploring the world and tackle those challenges that when we get robots in contact with the world, these challenges that get very messy, such as contact, such as um, multi-physics understanding and really going away from rigid robots to soft robots. So let me give some motivation. If you think of a motor as we use it also in robotics, that's really where it comes from. Like look at this motor as we find it in many electrical machines. This is an electrical motor that's just being disassembled but it's all made of rigid materials and rigid parts and it makes for systems like for example petman here which we probably all have seen was one of the early stage boston dynamics robots and um yeah this is supposed to play with some noise um it's probably not appearing on your end and since we're doing this on zoom sorry this doesn't work with the noise transmission but it's it's very noisy, I can tell you this. And um, one of the aspects is the noisiness, but the other aspect is just it's very rigid and hasn't much changed so far, even for the more modern robots. Even if you now think, for example, of this mini cheetah, which is a very agile and a, a bit more compact and also more lightweight robot than most of the Boston Dynamics robots, it still is using this mechanism of electromagnetic motors. And we're really trying to get away from having this design regime of using coils and shafts and motors that are inherently rigid. So if you look at nature, you, for example, see that they, nature uses muscles and muscles are not concentrated onto a single rotating axis, but they're quite distributed throughout the body. And each individual muscle itself is actually a long arrangement of fibers that contract when you give it some stimulation. And it just uses chemical energy to actually um, nourish itself and get, get, be able to run. And so if you take this as an inspiration, why don't you think of creatures that could be built using muscles and using mechanisms for locomotions, such as you see here. So you could imagine not just a whale pulling a ship, but maybe that ship that you see on the right side, not using a propeller anymore, but actually using a tail and that tail would be flapping around and then the ship would be moving forward. So don't just think of creatures that completely mimic nature, but only partially mimic nature and use this mechanism of continuous undulation, of continuous motion as we see it in nature. So today in my talk, I will be speaking about, first of all, how we're building underwater robots, such as you see on the top left, this is Sophie, which is swimming on the, in the ocean and is using this continuous undulation to mimic fish and to actually spy on fish. And then I will speak about how do we optimize and continuously optimize both design and control for these creatures using a computational approach, then I will be speaking about alternative muscle systems, not just the one that you see on the top left with 
glutic muscles, but on the bottom left, we'll talk about electrostatic muscles. And then if there's enough time, I will also be speaking a bit about going out of the water about manipulators that we use above water that can also be used for manipulation. So one of the works that was still happening during my PhD was this work where we built an underwater robotic fish and we took it on an expedition, exhibition. And this fish, as I already said, is called Sophie. And it's using this muscle as its main part of its body. Partially a robot is still rigid, but a lot of the robot is actually soft. And so here you see Sophie in the ocean swimming in a few different scenarios. And in all of these scenarios, it's just using its tail and a single pump to undulate the tail and causing it to swim and move forward. So we were taking basically going away from using a bunch of motors that would cause this undulation. We were just using one pump that flows water back and forth in the tail and then explore a coral reef, for example, to spy on fish like you see it in the bottom left. But so how does it work? Well, imagine on the right side that our tail was just a schematic of the tail. And on the left side, you see a motor that is flowing water into this tail. And as you're flowing water into each side of the tail, you're pressurizing the tail and causing it to deform left and right or up and down, however you see this. And in the case of Sophie, we would have two of these chambers, one on each side, and we flow water from one chamber to the other side and back again. And you could be using any type of pump, we just chose a so-called external gear pump to do so. And here you see a bit more of a detailed breakout of how the setup works. So on the left side, you see two views of the same tail and you see those flow inlets. And you can also see that there are hydraulic chambers on each side. And they are really what causes this sort of like artificial muscle to deform and go left and right. And on the right side, you see um, a DC motor. So at that stage of our research, we have not gotten away from motors as I was claiming that they are not what we want to use. But at this stage, we still needed them because the motor was providing power to the pump and the pump was then providing fluidic power in form of pushing water back and forth between the tail. So then you see here in this yellow, this is the pump. And then in blue, you see the, the gears. And these gears are rotating, powered by the DC motor in the back. And they flow water back and forth after you assemble this together and plug it into the tail. So then when you look at the full fish, it basically has this tail in the back. It has this mechanism set up in the center. And it has all of the electronics that it needs for controls and for filming and for acoustic communication in the front. And then you take this, this, um, this assembly of the tail and all of, this, of the pump and the buoyancy control unit and the dive plane and these, and you just look at the individual components. That's what we needed to get this fish to actually work. And on the other side, we have our diver interface module, which consisted of basically an assembly of a Raspberry Pi combined with a Super Nintendo controller. We put a soft membrane on this. We filled the whole thing with baby oil. And then we had our custom-made diver interface module that we could take as a diver underwater. And then between the true transducers that you see here in plaque, there's a transducer over here. Maybe I show this with um, my spotlight. So you can see a transducer over here and you can see a transducer over here. And these two transducers allowed us to communicate to the fish and send it signals and tell it what to do. So the way we do swimming, it was the most simplest approach to do controls with a soft robot was to go forward, we just alternate the flow direction of the pump. So we would say, let's pump in one direction and then pump the other direction and go back and forth. And this would just give us forward swimming. If we wanted to go in a turn, we would bias the flow and say, okay, we take more flow in one direction and less flow in the other direction. This allowed us to go in a turn without doing any feedback control here. It was just an open loop control where all we had to do was adjust the frequency and the amplitude of this overall control signal and the same for left turn. You just, you just turn it around. You basically pulse more water into the one side than the other given in any cycle of pulsation that you give to do this undulation of the tail. So this is us then underwater holding the control module, telling it, oh, for the next minute or two, just do this command and follow down this route. And then it would do this autonomously. And if it, after a few minutes, doesn't get any more signals, it will just stop swimming and stop recording at that moment. So this was our example of we navigating it over a coral reef. Here we used um, Sophie go over something called the cabbage patch. 
And then in the end, we were able to also show that we were spying on real fish that were interacting, coming by and looking at Sophie curiously and either swimming next to Sophie, as you can see over here, this is just one example, or you have several of them passing by, as you can see up here, passing by Sophie as Sophie is swimming towards them. So that was a first exploration using not a lot of fancy control techniques, just using an open loop controller, but using the, you would, might call it the embodied intelligence of this tail, just by it being continuously pressurized through the liquid. And the problem still remained that all of the setup was noisy and rigid for the most part, because only the tail was soft, the rest was quite rigid and was not really mimicking this natural inspiration as I was showing you the whale earlier in the slide deck. So now if we step forward and we look into uh, other systems, then we could say, let's get away from this motor and let's start using something that behaves a bit more like a muscle. It's, it's not real, a real muscle, but it's, it's an artificial muscle that more directly converts energy. And so here, if you look at these hydraulically amplified hazels that uh, Stefan has been setting up in our group, then you see that we can apply a voltage to this muscle and then it's, it's contracting. And we've been working on this together with our collaborator, Christoph Keplinger from MPI to, to start building a new way of building soft robots that don't use any more just uh, hydraulic muscles or pneumatic muscles, but actually using these electrostatic muscles. So by just looking at this, I maybe should spend a few more seconds to explain what is really going on. So you see here, there is a liquid down there and there's a liquid up on top. And then here, what you see in black is an electrode. And you have the same thing on the back of this and on the front, they're not touching with each other. So now there's a connection up here that sends electrical charges onto one electrode and this connection on the back side of it sends electrical charges on the on the reverse side of this and then as it's charging up this capacitor it's contracting and causing liquid to be squeezed into these pouches so you see a pouch up here and a pouch at the bottom and by causing that squeezing you see the whole thing kind of contracts together like a muscle does and down there you don't see this is a weight that's being pulled up so this is how this works and we then took this and said, well, let's build a fish with this approach. So we first started multi-material printing a housing and we, to simplify the problem, we first started with a so-called two and a half D fish. So we printed the fish and we had some planner support on the side. We used SEBS that was easy to print for us using pellets. And then we used some polypropylene to make a rigid material. So it was a single print on our printer. If you're curious to use this for your project, let us know. We have built this custom printer on our lab. We can print four materials at the same time. And then here you see, we put two of these muscles that I just showed you in the previous slide and they are contracting and causing this thing to go back and forth. We're capturing its deformation and then we're trying to match it with a muscle model that explains its deformation from a modeling perspective. So we overlaying this with an FEM model and in that FEM model, we are modeling the muscles contraction. Then we get swimming with these robots. Here, in this case, you still see we, we're running wires attached to this. So it's, in a not, it's a not untethered solution yet because the power supply sits outside of this. It's still quite massive because that has not been optimized yet and uh, put into place. And the muscles here are contracting by pulling one muscle on one side and the other muscle that causes the to swim. And so in this work, we actually showed that we got an optimized swimming behavior at around seven Hertz in oil. So this was done in oil because also our hazels were not quite waterproof yet. So these muscles that we call hazels, which is this hydraulically amplified self-healing electrostatic muscle is uh, so far only been explored for control optimization. But what if we want to optimize both control and shape at the same time? Well, then we do something called co-optimization for both these things at the same time. So if we think of this muscle as we see it in Sophie, which is using hydraulics, or if we think of the electrostatic muscle, then the question really is what shape do we use for this? Should it be this shape that you see here, or should it be any of these other shapes or anything in between within that design space or even extrapolating out of this design space? And well, to answer this question, we start proposing an algorithm that would allow us to continuously interpolate between all of these shapes. So for example, if you take three different shapes of fishes, so you see one here in this corner, one here and down in this corner, one down in this corner, we are able to say, okay, these shapes, we can interpolate them continuously, both the exterior shape or its bulk volume and its interior muscle arrangement within the bulk volume to come up with different designs of swimmers. 
And then we adjust the weights for each of the shapes and we get new, new shapes as we are adjusting those, those weights. So as you see here, we have all of the um, initial weights that we can say that would make one swimmer. And then if you put other weights, this would just make a different hybrid swimmer. And let me show you how this now works. So this is our ability that we can continuously adjust a weight from each of these shapes by bringing them in using a called so-called Wasserstein biocentric metric approach. And that allows us to, let's say we take three of these different designs and then we formulate this new hybrid design that lies somewhere in between. <coughs> and then from there, we design a controller that can either be an open loop controller that pulsates those muscles in an open loop fashion without any feedback, or it can be a closed loop controller that actually gets feedback from the muscles. And then we put it into a differentiable simulator. Well, you're wondering what is a differentiable simulator? I will explain it in a second. So we're putting this into the differentiable simulator that is able to propagate forward this fish in time. And then in the end, we get our losses for a given round of iteration and losses based on a certain criteria for our optimization. For example, our objective could be to fastly swim forward. And with that objective, we could say, okay, we are minimizing our loss for fast forward swimming, meaning how far can the robot fish get in a given unit of time? And then we are back propagating the gradients of this because we have set up our pipeline in a differentiable manner. We can back propagate the gradients and adjust both the geometric design and the control design with a gradient based method, such as let's say stochastic gradient descent or some other way of using the gradients for our optimization. So let's motivate a bit more differentiable simulation. So a differentiable simulation means we can directly do things such as not only optimizing, when you just saw uh, the design and shape using this particular example that we used in this paper called DevAqua, but we can explore a lot of different things. So let's say if our state of the positions of a robot and its velocities are being placed into a differentiable simulator and that outputs to us the future states in time, both for position and velocities, we can calculate a loss. So let's say you have a bending beam like the one here on the left and in the beginning it's just straight and then you let gravity act on it and it will fall down as you can see here. So as gravity acts on it, the loss will decide of how well does this beam achieve a certain objective. That objective could, for example, be that we want the bending beam to fall down to a certain height or we want the bending beam to fall and settle with a certain speed to a certain position. In order to achieve this, and as long as there are no internal actuation to the bending beam, it's just gravity, we can play, for example, with material parameters. So the loss, for example, here is over time, we want to get to a zero position of our, um, of our center of mass that is defined. And we want to achieve that zero position. We need to find out what material parameters to use. So the optimization sends back its gradient and we can then adjust the material parameters. So for example, we can make our material softer or stiffer as you see here on the left side. So for example, you can um, change its meshing. You can change also its material properties. And on the left side, you see this is a softer and on the right side, this is a harder material property. It gives you different deformation given the same pressure increase inside. You can play with actuation. So if this bending beam would have an actuator inside and not just external gravity, but let's say some muscles such as a hazel or such as a pneumatic muscle, then it could also be adjusted in how strong you actuate this in order to achieve your control objective. And finally, you can also play with external forces, not just gravity, but it could also be any other force that might be due to interaction forces that are acting on the structure. So now explaining why differential simulation, hopefully you get why it might be helpful to do this because it directly allows you to close this loop and do this quickly. Going back to the robotic fish example. So we start with the first design and then we optimize this design. So the initial design, which was a certain sets of parameters within this barycentric metric that I was describing to you, is not very good in forward swimming. We keep the control signal to be quite stable and it's just being this like sinusoidal control signal. We're not using a neural operator, a neural network for the control signal. And then we're optimizing this, um, just the shape. And you see, we come up with a shark design with our approach that we would have not necessarily come up with by just starting off with any of the three initial designs. So now the same, if you look inside of the fish, this is how the muscle behaves inside of the fish. And now if you look forwards and if you have the objective of not just 
optimizing the shape, but also optimizing the control signal. We did this experiment where we took the three initial shapes that were given by the expert designer who said, oh, I want my inputs to be one of this, this sort of like more traditional looking fish, a little bit fat, but more of a traditional type. And then these two type of rays here. And then we are just optimizing for the control signal, which was a neural network that's easily differentiable. And then we come up with both co-optimized the shape and the control signal, which is finally the simmer here at the bottom. So now you see within the simmer, we have this optimization of the muscle itself, sending the signal forward. And you see the final swimmer is more, it gets fast further forward in the same unit of time as any of the initial designs while we also have a custom control policy, meaning this closed loop neural network controller. So now you can not only do, let's say, objectives such as fast forward swimming, you could also do, let's say, efficiency being another thing that you care about. So that's a trade-off space. Having a fast swimmer doesn't always lead to a very efficient swimmer, and having a very efficient swimmer might not necessarily lead to a very fast swimmer. But if you explore this space, you come to this Pareto optimality problem where let's say you have efficiency on the y-axis and you have speed on the x-axis and you see how high speed and high efficiency is all within this trade-off space. And I'm plotting here, here just a Pareto front where you have the high speed all the way up on top and then you have all the trade-offs which are shown here in white circle and in black with white inner circles. And then we just pick out these individual examples in between. All the other gray dots are actually like points you can neglect because they're not Pareto optimal, therefore not really something you need to consider. they are not any like reasonable efficiencies given a certain speed or any reasonable speed given a certain level of efficiency. So now the question is, if you have made already design decisions about geometry and about control, let's look into the fish in terms of stiffness and in terms of internal geometry. So far we've looked into a simplified muscle and external geometry, but we haven't looked into material stiffness. So next step we took is we looked at to this um, different designs. So for example, we looked into a Nemo design, which we called this default design that had a silicon body. It had, for example, a certain number of chambers. And then we had a stiffer design and we had a design with less with more numbers of internal chambers that can be pressurized. And in the right side, you see our setup. It uses a load cell. We put air hoses on it that pressurizes, and then we have the fish, and it has the markers on it, and we can pressurize the setup. So we have the simple cantilever beam, and under gravity, it's, it falls down and it flexes. And as you see, as we are trying to do a material unification experiment as a first step, we're trying to understand, just optimize, for example, material parameters. And just to optimize material parameters, we can, for example, optimize for simple, simple things such as center of mass, vertical movements, as I described it to you earlier. And we can just adjust the Young's modules and the Poisson ratio of the material that we're using. And let me skip over the details, but here you just see in any case where we start with our Young's modules, it will always in the end iterate to the same Young's modules given our differentiable approach. So for any range of initial values, we converge eventually to a final range of using this. So then we applied this to our fishtail and we made this not just a simple beam anymore, but we said, okay, let's actually make this a tail that has cavities inside of it and that can be pressurized. And we even have effects such as buckling that our finite element method needs to capture. It's a differentiable finite element method where we are now comparing the simulation, which is shown here in red, which is actually comes here from the right picture. It's just overlaid on the left with the red dots. And we have to, um, sorry, the, the real image on the right is the blue dots, which are shown here as the rod, red crosses. Sorry, I get a bit confused here for a moment. And these are the blue dots that are overlaid on the fish. And then the simulation is what the actual center line of the simulation is. So we are matching those two using the differentiable simulation. So we're finding a material parameter such as Young's models and Poisson ratio given a neo hookian model, which we use in this case, to explain what the real world deformation of this tail do. So now when we do this experiment, this is how it looks like. The tail is swinging back and forth. We run a few of these experiments. We just observe its deformation using those dots on the back. We could obviously be a bit more fancy. And we, def we look at this for different designs, such as the Nemo design so, uh, with different pressurized, uh, pressure ranges, higher and smaller pressure amplitudes, different frequencies. And we see how well our approach works to find the material parameters given various data points that we put into our setup. So here you see 
Um, this is our data from the real actuator up on the top. And in the bottom, we get fairly small errors of up to 2.7% max error comparing simulation to the real um, setup. And we are able to find the material parameter starting in some randomly chosen points and then finding the actual material parameter. And quite interestingly, it's fairly close to what, let's say, the test would have shown if you would have taken the bulk material just of the two materials that we can get from data sheets. But this allows us to build more complex robots and identify the parameters without having to go through um, individual material characterizations and still getting a model that works well. And if you compare our approach to gradient-free methods such as CMAES, which is a gradient-free exploration, our approach that can use an atom solver, our gradient-based approach converges way faster after a few iterations compared to 40 different iterations that would be needed in case of um, a gradient-free approach. So now after optimization, we actually get quite a good matching as I was mentioning before, comparing the, the tail lateral position of the tail moving back and forth. And then we use the neural network to also predict the thrust that is occurring when we put the tail into water. Because so far what I've showed you was we looking at the tail without putting it into water. So if we not put the tail into water, we're not accounting for any interactions of the solid mechanics or of the tail with the water. So if we now want to also understand and have something that would work for a tail being in the water, we need to somewhat predict the, the liquid. So we did this also in this, in this paper, proposing a neural network that predicts the thrust behaviors that would then at least generalize for the range of shapes that we are studying this in this case. So now when we go a step further and look into using the same for electrostatic actuators and not for fluidic actuators, we can also do actuation optimization. So here you see the fishtail, it has its muscles in the center and we are looking at the bending angle and trying to understand how much bending we're getting. And we are proposing this muscle model that explains the deformation behavior of the muscle that we are putting into each side of this printed fish. And here you see um, comparison between the bending of the structure and what is our sim to real arrow that's plotted up top which turned out to be quite well matching. There was only during higher sudden peaks, we had a couple of a small, a larger error given the then high dynamic jumping behavior, but otherwise it would settle quite well to what the real experiment does. We also did force optimization so far. We haven't done it on the real fish with external forces so far. We've only done it on a bending beam. So on a real bending beam and on a simulated bending beam, real beam meaning we build in this out of, so, of a silicone elastomer. And we are investigating different problems of how can we get this to properly mesh. And we learned a lot about that we had to use certain hex mesh approaches for this to actually do a better job than let's say a proprietary solver would do or a poorly meshed meta, meta setup would, would do. And given gravity, you can look up this work, we were able to um, introduce an artificial damping force that would not only allow us to do steady state predictions, but also to do fairly good predictions for our transition states from explaining these oscillatory behaviors that we're seeing in the real experiments. So due to the way that our FEM works, it would not really do a good job in explaining these transition forces. So we had to introduce an artificial damping force that would explain this damping effect that would otherwise not be properly represented. So finally, we can also do, for example, more complex geometries such as the fish and try to optimize the forces that are acting on the fish to achieve a certain deformation. So these are steps towards external forces acting on our robots eventually such as our fish interacting with the world. So finally, a problem that we haven't approached yet so far was the problem of how do we deal with water, not just using a black box model where we use a neural network that explains the interactions of water with the tail, but we actually wanna use something that better explains the liquid behavior using something that actually properly accommodates neighbor Stokes and have that interact with our solid mechanics simulation that uses a proper FEM for the solid mechanics. So in this work that we recently published at ICML, we proposing to do multi-physics simulation of coupling on the one side, a solid mechanics solution that just uses a traditional FEM solution, such as you might've also heard from, uh, from SAC last week. And we coupling this 
with a learned and unsupervised learned neural network that actually predicts Navier-Stokes as its loss function in order to have a proposal that people in soft robotics could use to do this multi-physics simulation problem. For example, here we have a fish swimming in water. So we start doing this first in the planner case. So we're using a, a 2D example of we having a 2D fish and we having a 2D liquid. And then we both do, we do a differentiable simulation of the soft body swimmer. And we directly want to optimize the swimmer policy parameters, meaning its control policy. So how does it work? On the one side, we use this setup, which is basically an unsupervised physics informed or physics constrained neural network approach that uses its loss function as Navier-Stokes. So the loss function of this is Navier-Stokes. It doesn't need any prior data from a commercial solver. You just teach it for various randomized environments and then you get this environment. So here, for example, you see a fluid flow coming in, for example, on the left side, you have a fluid obstacle such as a cylinder. And in real time, you can just adjust this fluid flow obstacle and it will still predict you the flow phenomena and this slight turbulence that occurs afterwards. We call this our hydronet. Our hydronet is coupled with our soft body simulation. And our soft, soft body simulation is basically an FEM as you know it. We use something called the projective dynamics, which is an implicit Euler method, and that predicts the behavior of the, of the fish. So this differentiable simulation on the one side is what steps us forward in time for the body. So here QT and Q dot T is our is basically our um, positions and our velocities and our actuation HT is our muscle actuation inside of the fish. And then QT plus one is what happens after one time step. So now when you couple those two things, we have the numerical software simulation and we have this learned physics informed neural network for hydrodynamics. We couple those two things and the real challenge that was we had to solve in this work was how do we couple and overcome the problem of doing a fluid boundary condition that sends the fish position and the velocity as a boundary condition into the neural network. And then we had to back couple again, what are the thrusts from that neural network on a surface pressures that are acting onto the soft body simulation. So really that was the main contribution of our work. And what we then did is, on the fluid boundary side, we prepared a so-called boundary mass that's differentiable by using soft rasterization. Soft rasterization, you can imagine this to be, you can make the boundaries of your fish or whatever shape you want to approximate to be fuzzy and fuzzy and continuous. And this allows this to be a continuous propagation of, um, of gradients from uh, within the one side of our soft body simulation to something that we can propagate to the neural network based hydrodynamics. And then when we want to send the thrust back that comes from the hydrodynamics in, so in, in terms of surface pressures, we had to compute these thrusts in a differentiable method. And for that, we use something called the immersed boundary method using Gaussian distances. And with this method, we could then calculate in a continuous manner, what are the forces that are acting onto the body given the fluid surroundings. So this, Putting it all together into one diagram, this is what I was just trying to explain in, in this individual steps. So on the top, we have our differentiable simulator. It steps forward in time. It propagates using soft rasterization, the exterior shape, meaning we get the velocities on the surface that's called del um, delta sigma. It's shown here in this, um, in this like purple color around the shape. And we are propagating this into the body and then Hydronet gets this information and then forward predicts the pressures and the velocities of the fluid for the whole surrounding fluid. And then given those from the previous time step, the pressures, velocities on in the fluid with the inverse boundary method, we put in the thrust and that gives us back the information that is used in the differentiable simulation to predict what are the external forces acting onto the solid. So now as a result, we get an optimized swimming frequency with up to let's say a maximum velocity, we would we were optimized for finding maximum velocity swimming given this environment. So we we're not trying to explore the problem of any design optimization here yet. We were just assuming a given design, but we want to show that this pipeline works to find a maximum swimming velocity in a given liquid with a given viscosity 
and a given inertia. And so that was what we presented at ICML. And here is just um, an example of this neural network predicting this. And it's extremely fast overall. These things run um, within a within an order of a few seconds to forward predict something that would typically be fairly expensive to do with a traditional navier stokes solver. So now let's move forward to soft manipulation. I was talking a lot about underwater locomotion, but I want to tell you a little bit more about how can you also do manipulation with soft robots. So on the left side, we have our octopus that is using multiple tentacles that are deformable and adjustable. And it does this underwater, so it obviously would not work so easily out of the water. So, but it's still quite magnificent what an octopus can do underwater with all its tentacles and its suction and so forth. And if you go above water, and the extreme example there would be the elephant with its soft trunk that doesn't have any backbone. It just has like about 40,000 muscles that can just um, pick and go around environments and feel out environments. This is what an elephant trunk does. So one of the first things, or one of the more recent things we've done here, we have done this, uh, some of the works on this before, we, we said, let's try to build these soft trunks, but give them some proper reception so we can not only pressurize them, move them around and use cameras externally, but can we actually make them so they have the ability to also sense their own state without using external cameras? So we used, in this case, multiple segments, and each segment had multiple chambers, i.e. three chambers per segment, and then we put a capacitive flex sensor into each segment. So you see this capacitive sensor here on the left, and then we had two of these. Then we said, okay, we are um, postulating, in this case, a simplified model, allowing us to write something in real time in terms of control that uses a rigid model that we map as an augmented model that describes the deformation of the soft body. And it describes the deformation of this piecewise constant curvature model that describes the kinematics. And we put this rigid body model on top of it. Then in the end, we were able to say we can estimate both the states and the disturbances at the tip of the soft robot that you see moving down here. So it's pressurized with air, it's moving around, the arm is made with these fiber reinforcements around it. And then when it's holding something, let's say, for example, some fruits that, are, that this arm is picking with a gripper, we can predict what the forces are, the forces are just by using this internal capacitive sensor and our model. So that's what we showed in this first work called SOPRA. Then we augmented the workspace for this because in this case, we could only use the gripper in a limited range given two segments. We couldn't really like move a lot up and down. So we said, let's give it an additional degree of freedom up top that's still back tribable and still able to use pneumatics. But since we are away from where we are trying to move this arm, because here you say we are teaching the arm to move over here. We're using some motion capture in this case. And then we wanted to move over here and the arm is following, but we couldn't really make it move down into these areas that you see further below. For example, let's see this path to go into this area. We just wouldn't be able to do this because our arms can only bend each of these segments, but it cannot really move down. So what we did in this case is we said, okay, let's build a prismatic actuator that could be at the root of this that would expand the workspace and we can do a few more things. It was an extremely pragmatic approach and was fairly quickly prototyped, but it worked quite well. And so then we proposed this setup where our students like went ahead and said, okay, we have this, this arm, it's still soft on the bottom and it's using pneumatics and these pistons up top. And then we can expand the workspace quite efficiently with this. So it's a kind of a hybrid setup where we put something rigid at the roots and we put something soft at the tip or at the forefront of this arm. And then we could start reaching into environments that say we reach into a cup, we pick up an object, we move up, and then we move into the other cup and drop something. Or we move the arm down, pick up an object, and we can move it over. So with this, we got a in workspace increase of about 100% given this particular design. And we just wanted to show this idea of like, you can, in the roots, do something in a more hybrid approach without decreasing too much this, the payload capacity of our arm and maintain overall the compliance. And we even had the ability to have even a bit more forces that we could apply given this root joint that we put into it. So here you see a few examples of us picking up an object and moving around and then dropping it again or going into this environment. So finally, another thing we've looked into is, so far we've only looked into simplified models for these soft arms that use this augmented rigid body model. But we also looked into finite element methods that allowed us to model the softness of the structure plus the fiber reinforcements and any rigid segments in the structure. 
and we can then put in the end the side of what sensor we put in that that in informs our final finite element methods. In this case, we didn't use projective dynamics as we used it before, but we used um, a, a more traditional FEM approach that is within SOFA, which is a fairly popular modeling framework in soft robotics. And we had to then teach it how to also do fiber reinforcements and to then do things such as, for example, force predictions that are acting on the structure. So you see here on the left side, we have the arm as we build it. It's made with these two segments, each segment having three chambers. We are then postulating this model that is representing it geometrically accurately. And then we put an FEM model around it and we even model the fiber reinforcements on it. So here, you see, this is our known model that we have understanding of. We have certain pressures that go into it. And we basically say we have a certain pressure equality where forces end acting normal on each triangle. And they're proportional to the area that is of this triangle is making up. We have some rigidification of the intermediate segments because those were built rigidly to put some PCBs in there so we can put sensors in there. And then we put a band lab sensor into it, which is basically this capacitive sensor that goes to the center. And we also can feed this information into our FEM. We defined these constraints within the FEM as high stiffness springs that are wrapped around the arm. And then we map that to the mesh model using something called a barycentric mapping. And that barycentric mapping is something fairly similar to what I was describing to you earlier in the diff aqua work where we're optimizing fish shapes. But in this case, we're using it to map how the forces of the spring are acting onto the nodes of our FEM. And then in the end, we said, okay, let's solve for the actuator pressures that would explain all the orientations that we measure. So meaning, let's figure out what is the pressure that is required to get to this orientation. So we, we are observing from the real robot orientation, and then we find out what are the pressures to do this orientation. And we compare this against the real measured, and we then first start doing this for single chambers for this conference work. Then we did a teach mode where we were teaching the robot a certain pose, and our model would find to explain that pose and hold that pose. And so on. So we push the robot basically into a certain position, not pressurizing the robot at all. And then once the robot is pushed into this position, we are finding through the FEM what pressure we need to apply to hold that position. That's what we call the teach mode. And so you see how we are putting the arm into this position We're using a metal stick. And then on, on the right side, you see we are identifying in real time, or like in, in, it was sped up 3x, so it was a bit slower, um, what is actually needed to achieve this. And then finally, we also want to estimate the disturbances on this arm, so we are putting forces onto the arm and they're applying to the end of the arm. And we are able to estimate what these disturbances are and be comparing this against a force estimation that we, uh, um, that we are predicting with our um, uh, force gauge that we're using here. So finally, another thing we've done recently, not using the FEM model, but using a model predictive controller is we said, okay, let's actually try to, to build an arm that can look forward in time from a controls perspective and apply some of the modern model predictive control techniques that are known for say rigid robots and use them on a soft continuum robot, but using this augmented rigid body model. And with this, we propose the so-called, we use the soft robust MPC formulation for a soft pneumatic manipulator that operates in task space. And then we validate onto our real hardware if it actually works and it did work. And it was a way of, enriching just a sort of typical augmented rigid body model that previously we would only run as a model-based controller in a single control loop, we could now actually look forward in time using this MPC approach. And if you look at this, we, we could say using, for example, an external constraint that's shown here in red, that we just artificially define in our space for our end effector trajectory, which is shown here in the dotted line, it's the reference line. And then we, we would use either a penalized or we would use a soft robust MPC approach and we would look how well would that be able to control the arm given this control and given this external constraint. 
And we also looked into model-based adaptive controller on the on this is a different work where we said, can we actually do an adaptive controller that can tune itself online over time to account for modeling inaccuracies? Because we have a lot of modeling inaccuracies given a simplified augmented rigid body model that doesn't use a full FEM. So here we combined the terminal starting surface with um, an adapt adaptation law for our task-based controller, applied it to the same rigid arm and we were able to show control experiments on the setup. So here on the left side, we would, for example, so this is an unsatisfactory example where we would change the payloads using just a traditional inverse dynamics controller. And we would, for example, follow a circular trajectory on the left, or we would follow a star-shaped trajectory on the right. And then in the end, when we were trying to um, uh, to track it, we would record that tracking and comparing it to our um, adaptive sliding mode controller, which is now shown here with the green title. And we observed a much smaller average error in the trajectory in the following, and even our model didn't account for the payload that the picker, that the scripper picked up. In this case, we picked up a, a cluing stick. And so in the unloaded case, we got a smaller error. And even in the loaded case, the error was comparable. So it was accounting for it online using this adaptive sliding melt controller. So finally, I wanna talk about um, one more thing that we've done, which is going away from model-based controllers and using model-free controllers for these switched arms, for these soft arms. And so what we're proposing is something called a deep stochastic Copeland operator to control our arms. So we give an input to our, this is our plant, this is our setup. It gets an input, there comes an output, and then we need some sort of setup that can control it again. And really the question is, we don't know the dynamics of the setup, but we know both the setup has noise and there's also noise coming in in the observation. And so really, can we, use a non-traditional learning and a non-traditional control approach it's like instead of using a traditional control approach such as let's say adaptive learning adaptive control we want to use something where we learn it from small samples numbers of samples and still get an accurate and concise model so what we did is we proposed this stochastic approach to a composition operator i.e a coupling operator where we take state observations, such which we call X, those are observations of the state of our soft arm. We are lifting this into a, a lifted state space where we have states in that lifted space. And then we use a Copeland matrix coupled with a control matrix that allows us to operate linearly in that lifted space with a much higher states in that lifted space, and then back propagate back into the space that our robot is operating in. And the way we did this is we learn a neural network that does this lifting into this expanded space. And then we describe our states in this lifted Copeland space using a mean and a variance. So we just use a variational description of this. And then we are um, forward propagating that space. Sorry, this is cut off in the bottom. This is basically a distribution over, um, this is a variational formulation that's just steps forward using a linear matrix A. And we can also linearly put in our control input into this matrix B. And we need to train all both this new network here. We need to train the control matrix A and B given the data that we observed from the robots during initial training data set recordings. In the end, we have a linear observation matrix that propagates back the states into the space that we're operating back. So this is uh, the observable space back in the task space. So now, the plant basically, sam we sample from the plants, we get a data set that trains the so-called DISCO model that we, as we call it, deep stochastic Copeland operator. It trains both the neural networks and these Copeland matrices, which are just linear matrices. And with this, we can then define a controller that uses this model combined with an MPC controller to look forward based on this DISCO model. And then we use this for control. And we first did this in simulation and then later we applied it to this arm. And that allowed us to then do control on the soft arm where we put in control inputs U and we get states X of T out of it. So here we just show some examples first on the card pole. And just given the time, let me just wrap this up soon. We were able to, as one of the highlights, we were able to use this and compare it even to a learn as to a reinforcement learning approach 
using, for example, card pull because that's what it has been very often used. So for example, using soft actor critic on a card pull and B could use this disco model and get a way better disturbance rejection where instead of just for, in this case, we could go up to four times the disturbances and still keep our card pull stable using our MPC controller, which a reinforcement learning controller would not be able to do. And then we did some examples with the robot arm and we followed certain trajectories and moved them along. And just let me step forward. Um, finally, I wanna just mention one last work that we've done. We've also started using not just arms with simple crippers, but put those crippers onto other platforms, for example, on a drone where we use a cripper that can allow us to, to do picking of objects. This is actually a focus project. So it's a focus team that did this where they uh, at ETH in, in the focus of in a in the course of one year made a cripper that can pick up objects, fly them around, and drop them, for example, here into a bin. And the purpose of this was can we do a quick manipulation and pick up objects in on the fly and and pick them up and basically do manipulation this way. Here is another way, slow down. This is how the drone is approaching, going to the object, picking it conforming to it. It's a fairly simplified soft gripper. It's called a FinRay gripper that was developed originally, I think, by Festo. And we put it onto this drone and showed that we can do manipulation fairly rapidly. And then in the end, we also used this hydraulic hazel muscles and we also built a gripper and showed that we can make it untethered and not just tethered like you saw in the fish before, but make it untethered and have it pick up objects that, uh, let's say in this case, um, using a muscle that is electrically controlled and not anymore with electromagnetic models, but with electrostatic models. Okay, so with this, let me jump to the final conclusion of our talk. Um, let me just first give an acknowledgement to, to the team. So these are the people in my group that have been doing this research that I just showed to you. We have a couple of people also doing biohybrids work, which I don't have time to talk about today. Um, but most of the work that was done is what is done by the people shown here in yellow and also shown here in red and also a group of really talented bachelor master students that were working on this, what I showed you today. And with this, this is my summary. Just to recap, we, we talked about robotic fish, its optimization, what we've done so far on this, um, then using electrostatic muscles and then also building arms with grippers. And now I'm open for some questions. Thank you very much, Robert, for the great talk, a lot of cool things. Uh, let's open the stage for questions. <clears throat> you can either unmute yourself and ask or just um, write in the chat and I will repeat the question for you. Hey, Robert. Um, Hi, Emilio. Since nobody's asking questions, so I will take this opportunity. Um, yeah, sorry, I was late uh, joining the talk, but I, I was there. Um, so something that uh, you've mentioned, right? So you've done the co-design of the control and the shape of the fish, right? Yeah. Uh, but I, I, uh, I didn't hear much about... So at some point, you, you talk about uh, proprioception, right? As, uh, what is called like the... <laughs> Um, some form of perception, for example, of the actual shape of the robot, or maybe pressure on the skin of the of the fish and things like that. Yeah, are these yeah, things exactly. that are worth considering that you are considering that doesn't matter? Um, so here we, we put capacitive sensors in, for example. You mean this one, right? Mm -hmm. So we put a sensor in. For yeah. the shape, right? Yeah, How exactly. About the, Pressure, pressure of the water on the on the skin. Is that something that is important to sense? Would yeah. So, um, the, the the problem is, we have not built any robot yet. Uh, that mm -hmm. we've only built, we have ongoing work that have we have not yet finished, where we put sensors onto the skin of the arms to measure contact at all points along the arm, so that we could actually predict where army making contact on the arm that we then know from the model-based control that we need to predict forces at this point. We have not done finished that yet, but we have approached to do that. Um, for the fish, we do yet have to build a fish that actually has sensors on its skin. And it's actually not yet on the 
immediate next few years to do to do this because we are currently focusing just on the muscles to put into this fish and make that integrated they can actually just swim for when we model the the simulator in the simulation case yes we need to know those forces but we we have the hydrodynamics we know what forces are acting we then sending those forces to the solids right. simulation right. and do it back right. but but what we all, the only thing we get from the real experiments is for example we measure certain points of the fish and as it's moving through the tank so we can do validation experiments where we are just tracking certain points and that alone is that alone is allowing us to inform our simulation and then we can do, for example do actuation matching we can do uh, stiffness right. matching we don't need to know the forces on the outside of the tail well, i was just thinking what you know whether that would be useful for the control design right and then as you said yeah in simulation you can just pretend that you have a sensor and see if the control is aware of the of the pressure profile and you know, things like that would that so for the moment we like would that. use the camera or we we use the camera on board of the fish for simple control high level control decision making so if you want to do any planning of the fish underwater we i mean to if you so look at rovs that they that's different use, no no it's different yeah uh -huh. but we have not we have not looked into technically yes it would help if we know where we apply we're getting a pressure an increased pressure due to turbulence in the flow acting on the fish that would help us for more stable swimming let's say in a in a flow channel that we want to do keeping where we're introducing artificial disturbances but it's really hard i have to say it's really hard to get uh, a sense imagine, of skin around imagine. it uh -huh. okay. <clears throat> but it's, yeah i, I think also thinking of, um, you know, you know, a uh, fish has also a bunch of other fins, right? So uh, dorsal fins yeah. and pectoral fins and things like that, right? So I'm, I'm wondering, do they actually sense, do they have, a, I, I mean, I guess that they do have a sense of the water flow around them, right? They have a lateral organ on the sides, plus mm -hmm. what you're saying with their, with, I mean, all of their muscles, can sense when there's an external forcing that goes beyond the typical drag forces. Uh, right. And then that that helps them to determine, but they, they do have the lateral organ itself that can also, that they use to do, for example, formation swimming. And mm -hmm. I mean, down the road, this is really things that we are working on. For the moment, we're doing it on the arms because it's easier to make progress outside right. of the water. But eventually, it will also go back on the, onto the actual fish that we can sense pressures on the fish. And as you're saying, when we were using motors in the past for the first fish robots, they were not really scalable to go to many muscles so we could have fins on the side that are just as soft. So that's where we're working on these electrostatic muscles because they will allow us to have many fins more miniaturized mm -hmm. throughout the structure. And these muscles are actually proprioceptive in the sense that we can sense also a force applying to them, not only actuating, but also sensing, and then that will get us eventually closer yeah. to this goal. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's still a, those are really right questions. Those are really the, the hard problems to solve. And I'm already quite happy when I see them building a fully integrated electrostatic muscle robot, because there is, by the way, there's not really compact power electronics yet existing for these high voltage low current power and these muscles so we have to build them and make them as compact as possible it's just engineering work that needs to be done understand thank you thank you robert thank, thank you for the question thanks. thanks any other questions i have a, I have a, I have a technical question then and yeah so i find uh, you know, the technology innovation that you bet your work on is the, this idea of, uh, well, neural networks, but also in particular the idea of differential simulators. And yeah. uh, I, I mean, you showed uh, several diagrams. And uh, maybe yeah. my question is uh, differentiable with respect to what? Like, to, oh, differentiable with respect to the design parameters. So if I go back to this here. Oh, uh, maybe the easiest diagram to look at, which summarizes all of them, is this slide here. So, so differentiable can be in if you start if you think about from a traditional 
FEM simulation, what you need to define is material parameters, such as the softness. You need to define where do you have, let's say, internal forces that come through pressurization. And you need to define where you have external forces. And so if you make your pipeline differentiable for any of these things, then you can optimize for any of those things. And you can, in the case of the fish swimmer, when I was showing you the other pipeline here, we are going a level higher. We are not worrying so much about the material, individual material properties. We are just worrying about interpolating between different shapes. And so here you see, we can say we have different shapes of fishes, for example, this, this Nemo fish or this ray. And all we're doing is we overlaying probability distributions of each of those shapes to get to a joint probability distribution that we then take a threshold and that gets us our new shape. And that allows us to, if you look at this here, so this is just a GIF that shows you how we are interpolating between these three different shapes. And we can linearly interpolate between all of these shapes. And so each shape comes in as one parameter. And this is one parameter that we make our full pipeline differentiable for. So meaning in the end, when we have our loss, our loss not only knows how well we swim forward, but we also know the gradient given this one parameter of how much we would add or remove a certain fish shape into the mix of the overall shape that we want to get to. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah, but like I that's... have another question. Like the, if you say you have the simulator to be differentiable from the design parameter to yeah. the trajectory, I imagine. Yeah. Like, in general, that is not differentiable, right? Because uh, you could have something that's uh, just stable and then you push it one direction or the other. Will uh... So my question is that, do you actually have a, a relaxed uh, simulator which is actually differentiable or you can just ignore this uh, non-differentiability? Um, so in this simulator here, we are not making contacts. So this simulator is just open space swimming of a fish, for example. So mm -hmm. the, the chaotic nature of contact, we have not yet made differentiable, if that's what your question is about. <laughs> um, does, yeah, I wasn't that... thinking about contact, but I was thinking, like if you have a pendulum that's you know, in equilibrium yeah. up, and then you change you know, whatever little mass that you have, and it goes yeah. either one direction or the other, yeah. so there, there's no contact there, but it, it's non-differentiable. Uh, okay. Oh, why? Is it non-differentiable? If you formulate your dynamics, even if you think of an articulate body model where you mm -hmm. formulate your dynamics with, let's say, auto differentiation, you could use auto differentiation and template your um, your model. Let's say, take a take a simple multi-body model, take a Featherstone algorithm or something like this, and you then put the parameters of the size of your mass. You make that to be an auto differentiable parameter then your code uh, would then in the end provide you a final cost where you also have part of it being that parameter of the size of your pendulum mass. And then you know that your loss, then, and because it uses the auto differentiation rules, which is expensive, but it would, you would have that part of it. You would also know the gradient in regards to this parameter that you made auto differentiable. Does that make but sense? Well, I think your reasoning works when you're thinking about uh, instantaneously, you know, my Jacobians might be differentiable with respect yeah. to the parameter, but yeah. the entire trajectory is not, right? Because uh, like you can start with a slight difference, right? And then you yeah. either go to the left or to the right. Yeah. And so you cannot, it's not differentiable with this. The final code is not differentiable with respect to the parameters, but maybe you only need to be differentiable like at each time step. It's not the so, trajectory, the velocities that you think are differentiable. Right. So in this case, we looked at a lumped metric. For example, total distance swum, right? So just assuming the fish swims forward has a has a symmetric actuation of its of its muscle. And we did not try to reason about the trajectory for example we have not even and even looked into the ah, problem so, so of you, differentiability so you, need of that. so you only need the differentiability from parameter to outcome to performance objective exactly yes okay so but i've not even dived at all into this really important question of 
how would you optimize the even the trajectory of this in the sense of making that more optimal? We have not started doing that. Um, we've only looked the same to efficiency, into forward swimming. But one of uh -huh. the opposite next steps would be: can we also investigate like optimization of its trajectory? So far, it was really only simplified muscle control and forward swimming performance that comes out of this muscle control. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? You could actually, you know, want to define some maneuvers that you want to do, and then uh, yeah. you, you well, if you in, if you, you define know, a maneuver and you would just take as a lump metric the amount of total turning, it would still remain differentiable because the lump metric is how much you've turned. If you don't really uh -huh. care about how you've turned. Does that make sense? Yeah, like, I got it. Long, yeah. Right. So you like you introduce a bias into how much your left to right muscle is being actuated over time in some. And then the lump simulation, the differentiable simulation just would give you 100 time steps forwards. And for those 100 time steps forward, the way we formulate the differentiable simulator would still give you the differentiability for this parameter. Let's say mm -hmm. the geometric design. Mm -hmm. But you. I mean, uh, to be honest, I've not dived more into the intricacies of the actual motion planning here. And I mean, that's an obvious question that you're asking, which makes sense because that's one of the things that you and the group uh, has been also very interested in. And I'm happy to talk more about this and to see if what are the challenges with differentiability once we go into motion planning, trajectory planning even more. Mm -hmm. Do you have other questions? I, I'm good, thank you. It's, it's thank you. If you would have more questions. Yeah, is there any maybe closing question? Actually, my, I had a question which was about yeah. understanding better this diagram. And uh, actually, the question of Andrea converged into that. So, um, yeah, I was interested in what kind of other metrics could characterize trajectories and could be um, differentiable yeah. with respect to your loss. But you kind of answer saying, for instance, the amount of turning uh, as opposed to the the particular ways in which you turn. So those right, those, are those were are... those are things that we will not capture because it's just yeah, a yeah. lumped metric that comes out of the final swimming, right? Mm -hmm. So. We have not even looked into this. If we want to do path planning design and bring this into it, there would be definitely a very valuable extension, but we have not even looked into that at all. Of how yeah. how would that ever be differentiable under what circumstances, uh, under what constraints that you assume for the path or so. But to be quite honest, I don't even think I will start. I don't think I will start getting into this anytime soon because it would be a bit too far away from our core objective of like doing initial steps in core optimization just for shape and simple control. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought it was related to. I remember you had a metric called efficiency. And I thought yes. this could play a role. A role. Oh, the, uh, the efficiency. Right, but we've only looked for the efficiency metric here. We've looked into. Uh, we assumed that muscle contractions contain a certain cost, a certain energy cost mm. for those contractions. So as you're not only having the metric of how far has the fish gotten swimming forward in a fixed unit of time, you're also adding up how much muscle energy was used in that time. And that was what we made the simulation okay, okay, differentiable for. Very good, very good. Um, but, but I mean, if you find this interesting, I would love to collaborate on the question of how can we maybe introduce planning into this? And that's also back to Andrea. And I'm also happy to learn that it might be completely impossible. <laughs> like, like, that's fine. Yeah, who knows? Um, who knows? Um, okay. Thank well, you for the question. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert, for the talk. Um, I guess if thank you very much for questions. giving me the chance to present. Thank yeah. you very much. If you somebody has other questions, maybe can reach out to you by email. Yeah. Uh, but yes. Yeah. Thank you. Again. My email. Thank you. My email. I can put on the slide here. Maybe that was my overlook. Yeah. I will. I will type it on the slide here.
in case you want to send me an email to follow up. There you go. Great. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very thank much, you very much. Uh, Robert, and uh, wish you good luck for the next steps. And thank you all for yeah. participating. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.